morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, we are here. I asked Robert what he wanted to talk about. Uh, and he uh, titled this, It's More Than Just Engagement. So why did you want it? Why is that the title? Uh, you know, I, uh, I think there's been an enormous focus on employee engagement. And I know you're going to hear from the partnership. They've done a great job of translating the data we have on employee engagement into information that can really help people change their organizations for the better. And it is almost a physiological fact that the more engaged your employees are, the better performing, the higher performing they will be. But at what? If you don't have uh, a benchmark with which to measure their contribution to important outcomes, then happy employees are a good thing, but to what end? Are they accomplishing important things for the American people? Are they simply uh, like um, hamsters in a hamster wheel, just churning out activities, papers um, that don't really contribute to an, old, an, an important outcome? That's not what we want. So uh, I think it's important to put it all into context. And, and where do you think we are with engagement right now? I know, you know there's the employee viewpoint survey every year. What, what's your read of how things are going now uh, into the second year of the new administration? Um, well, the, the, they have sustained uh, almost a decade now long look at employee engagement. And we've got incredible data. Uh, we should have a lot of lessons learned about what does and doesn't impact um, employee engagement. Uh, and if leaders aren't taking serious, responsible steps to improve engagement, um, then shame on them. But you know, if you walk through a department or agency today, you can almost smell, that's probably a bad thing to say, because that's, that's literally true, but not where I want to go with this. Um, you, can, you, you can really see whether the management is, is is creating an environment and whether employees are genuinely happy to be where they are. Um, and then, of course, there are policies they put in place. Uh, you've, you've seen some related to telework. You know, there's a, there's a serious discussion to be had about how to manage telework. But to use it in a punitive way, that's not going to help you win a lot of fans among your workforce. I don't know if I discount the, um, the smell remark too much. When I was at GSA, we were in a sort of, I, I guess we called it a holding pen, um, not at 1800 F Street before they had opened the new building. Um, and the plumbing leaked, and there was no cell service, there was no windows, we were in the basement. Um, it made a big difference when we moved to 1800 F where you could see the sun um, and the bathrooms were clean. I mean, th those, I think, I think your point was a larger one, but... No, 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 I think those the are little important. things. Those right? are important yeah. aspects too, right? right? Yeah. Yeah. You need a good cafeteria. You can't. It's totally I, I don't miss a meal, so uh, <laughs> I can't imagine employees um, can make do with a lot less. Um, so, other than the sort of kind of things that made probably a lot of, if you came here to attend this, you were probably aware of a lot of the ways that the government works to improve uh, employee morale, engagement. What are some of the non-traditional ways, or one of the, some of the things that you did when you were at OMB that um, you tried to use to help improve uh, engagement that maybe are not kind of top yeah. of mind for you, our You know, OM, OMB was an interesting place. Um, you'd think the White House is very hierarchical. I spent about eight years at, at OMB. You'd think it's very hierarchical, but there's so much work to be done that it becomes really flat and egalitarian. Work flows to the talented. Um, and so it was really uh, a cohesive team up and down and wide. Um, so having an open door, uh, engaging people at all levels, um, you know, hosting events with a diversity of your workforce, en engaging with their leaders, um, that can make a really big difference. And, and then small things, awards. We don't have a lot of money to give to our people, so simple recognition can go a very long way. Um, and the federal government is particularly good at this. In, agencies are particularly good at acknowledging people who have made a contribution to their mission. Uh, you mentioned something, uh, the work flows to the talented. 
Um, <clears throat> and not to These are my own not horn. the questions we agreed on, Adam. <laughs> But I'm finding that very much at Grant Thornton these days that workflows to the talented. So um, <laughs> I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, about employee burnout versus um, how do you optimize the folks that you are on your team? Um, uh, where you have people, I, everyone knows that different teams, everyone has different strengths and weaknesses. Um, and one of, our, one of our norms at Grant Thornton is all styles get results. Um, I was talking to my wife about that the other day and she was disagreeing with my approach. So I'm not <laughs> sure she's bought in, but um, what, what's your view of how um, the kind of balance of workload across teams, particularly teams that are smaller and more taxed, um, what are some of the things that you think government can do to try to balance that a little bit better? I would say raise your hand if you're a federal employee who considers him or herself undertaxed. Um, yeah, you're either shy or I've made my point. Um, I, uh, this is a real challenge in the federal government. Hire contractors? I don't know. Um, the, Shameless plug. That was a Shameless joke. Plug. Uh, <laughs> I get his jokes because uh, we share an office. The, the, so I'm required to laugh. The, um, uh, it, it's leadership's responsibility to make sure that workload is distributed among the workforce. It's hard to do under current constraints because there's more workload than people. Um, and you will have people who take on uh, more than their fair share. So, you know, as you know, we do at Grant Thornton, we monitor, we've, we've gone to no leave. So you can take an unlimited amount of leave at Grant Thornton. And it seemed like a really crazy thing to do and that everybody would just never come to work. And we find the opposite to be true. People aren't taking nearly as much leave as they used to. So we have to tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, you need to take some time off because you're going to burn out. And we don't, we, we, we'd rather have you um, really productive on fewer days than unproductive on more days. Um, but you know, in the federal government, in addition to being saddled with a bunch of the practices and policies we have in place today, we do a really terrible job of holding poor performers accountable. And that's uh, debilitating to morale. And we need to really step up our game in taking as aggressive, quick action as we can to highlight poor performers, take actions to remedy that, or get rid of them altogether, because it can really destroy what you're talking about, which is fair and equal distribution of workload. If you're getting the same amount of money and recognition as the slob next to you who's not coming to work or, or, or doing their fair share, that, what, what, why is that motivating to you to work harder? Let's talk about recruitment and retention. I just saw recently the latest time to hire stats have, I don't want to say ballooned, but they have increased significantly. Um, how is engagement and morale impacting um, recruitment and retention efforts? Um, your workforce is your best marketing tool, um, and they can help you recruit talent to your organization. And um, the federal government needs that. Uh, so, uh, so focusing on engagement is going to help you recruit and retain. It, we shoot ourselves in the foot, though, if we can't compete with others. You know, when Grant Thornton visits a campus on a recruiting trip, it makes offers, job offers, within 24 hours of those visits. So we'll, we'll you know, talk about our interviews in the ride to the airport and then decide the next day to make those offers. Um, that's different than I think it was uh, 127 days. That's right. New staff that's right. For and I'm not hire. suggesting that, you know, there are reasons <laughs> for controls in the federal government, yeah. but it takes too long, and it's our fault uh, that it takes too long. Um, anybody involved in the hiring process should take responsibility for their role in it and get after it and finally do it because there's just no reason it should take that long. You know, focusing on time to hire is um, maybe the wrong 
data point in some cases because you really want the right person and it may take a genuinely long time to hire people. Uh, but in general, most steps in the process are either taking too long or completely unnecessary. And leadership needs to take the bull by the horns and make sure that the whole end to end um, is responsible for getting that, for getting people job offers, getting people on the job as soon as practical. So how is this related to civil service reform? And I know there's been a lot of buzz uh, with the new administration and in Congress too about the potential for civil service reform. I'm wondering what's your view of the chances of that happening and what do you think are the most needed reforms? The, chan the It's badly needed. Our civil service system is badly outdated. Uh, the chances for reform, I don't, I'm, I'm trying to find the right metaphor, but I can't really seem to find something that captures the impossible. Congre right. Congress is in screw. Um, yeah, <laughs> the, uh, it's gonna be really hard to get it done, and the, the closer we get to the midterm elections, the harder it will be. Um, you know, uh, calling it out is a risk, but the veteran's preference or the way it's applied today is an enormous barrier, both to hiring general and to hiring veterans. So figuring that out would be um, really helpful to the overall hiring process. Uh, the president's budget had a great chart about the myriad ways you can appeal adverse actions. Um, and uh, to simplify or streamline that process would help us get at a core issue, which is dealing with poor performers. None of, waiting for that is an excuse. We got plenty of tools in place, Kathleen talked about them, uh, um, that to, to dramatically improve uh, human capital management in the federal government. I do wanna give a shout out to Kathleen. She's, you know, she represents one of the quiet heroes in the civil service who are manning the fort while waiting for political leadership to get in place. And so um, we owe her a tremendous debt of gratitude for keeping the trains driving towards the right direction. So you um, agreed. Um, you mentioned uh, Thank you. some of the tools. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. Uh, some of the tools at our disposal. One thing that popped into my head was uh, I was a Schedule A appointee at GSA. I ran the Federal CIO Council. Um, and I applied for the position to switch to becoming a Fed. I had done the job for two and a half years. I had the highest performance ratings. I did not make the original certification, the cert list, for the job that I had been doing for two and so a half years. So this is about me, not about you. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, I forgot, I forgot. <laughs> anyway, that's a, that's a little anecdotal story about, you know, I think there are things without large scale right. reforms that, are, that, that we can be doing to improve um, uh, the whole apparatus that, of the civil service. Um, and I think from what I've learned, both when I was at GSA and since I've left, I, I feel like a lot of civil servants themselves are kind of thirsting for this too. Um, maybe I'm reading that wrong. No, 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 I think, you know, the first, uh, the people on the front lines are they gonna be the first ones to tell you what needs to be fixed. So the last question we have here is, uh, talking about the state of performance measurement. I think you, know, there's, you can think about performance measurement in terms of government programs and whether they're being effective um, uh, reaching their mission, but you can also think about it in terms of how do you, some of the things we've talked about, how do you reward high performers? How do you know who's performing well and who's not performing well? Talk a little bit about performance measurement and how it, uh, the kind of tools that you can use that overlap those two types of um, analytical feats. You know, I think uh, my, my focus throughout my career has been on outcomes, trying to get government entities to articulate what it is they're trying to accomplish that's an important outcome uh, to, to the American people. It's hard to connect what a government employee is doing to those ultimate outcomes, but we need to strive to get that right. Um, we, the pendulum swings in the federal government, in my view, from too few or too little measurement to way too many. Um, and I think we're, the pendulum is on the too few right now because setting broad cross-cutting measures uh, that are too few doesn't really capture 
the contributions that employees are making to important outcomes. And so you're left without having a benchmark with which to measure their contribution to those, those outcomes. So in, in my view, that's a gap. Well, uh, thank you all for, uh, for showing up today, for coming. I hope you learned something with our, our small portion of this. Uh, we're excited to be here. Thanks much to the GovExec team um, for putting this together. Um, and hope you enjoy the rest of the program. Thanks very much. Thank you, Adam.